Good morning. This morning in our Bible study, we'll be uh, looking at part two of the sermon by Pastor Alistair Begg on Melchizedek. The mystery of Melchizedek is the title of it, part two. Well, having watched it, I know you'll enjoy it. So sit back, enjoy, and then please stick around and listen to our discussion afterwards. Thanks for joining us. Have a blessed rest of your day. All right, 602, we should be we should begin. I'll begin with a word of prayer. Um, we'll talk about our friend uh, and uh, high, great high priest, Melchizedek, whom our Lord is a type of. Um, and we'll get into it. Uh, Heavenly Father, for this time together, we give you thanks and praise. Lord, thank you for this medium that we use that uh, we can meet together wherever we are. And uh, Lord, we ask you to make your word real to us. Open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us, because this is a, it's all scriptures given for reproof and for, for instruction. Uh, it's all important. It's all good. But this this section of, of uh, Hebrews is especially uh, fascinating. Um, show us what you have us to know, Lord, in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. We're looking today at part two of the uh, uh, video from uh, Alistair Begg on Melchizedek, the <clears throat> quote, mystery of Melchizedek, end quote, the official title, part two. Uh, I think you'll find it's there's more meat than we had last week, but it's good stuff. Uh, so I, uh, morning, Joe. Welcome. Wow. And you're you're muted. Nope. Is, okay, I'll ask everybody to mute, and I'll begin our uh, I'll begin the uh, movie. The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth for Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. Well, let's turn once again to Hebrews chapter 7, shall we? It's good to see that uh, some brave souls have come for a second dose. And um, we left it this morning by noting the question in verse 11, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come? And we said that was the, if you like, $64,000 question in the book of Hebrews, because the great issue that is being addressed is how men and women may, as he mentions in verse 19, draw near to God, and how that was going to be possible and what the implications of it would mean for life was essential in the instruction of the writer. In point of fact, the phrase draw near to God or drawing near to God is used on multiple occasions throughout the book, and it is used in different ways. I won't take time to belabor the point, but if you check the phrase drawing near to God, you will find that it is clearly used for trusting in Christ for salvation, receiving the forgiveness of our sins, continuing to trust in Christ's priesthood, persevering in faith despite difficulties, boldly coming to God in time of need, asking God for his help, being faithful to God, and keeping on doing the will of God. And all of those dimensions of Christian experience are caught up in this phraseology. So it is clearly a vital, essential phrase. If all of that is contained in it, then it is imperative that his readers and that we would understand how it would be possible to draw near to God. Now, the reason it is so central to his argument is because the whole function of the priesthood was to bring men to God, to make men and women the partakers of his favor and of his image and of the joy and happiness which God alone could provide and to do so in the extent of their nature and in the eternity of their being. In other words, it was no flash-in-the-pan experience. It was to have one's life completely taken over by the power of God, indwelt by the Spirit of God, and lived in the service of God. And this was not something that was to be marked simply in a moment in time, but was to be categorized by a life of steady pilgrimage. And in order for that to be the case, certain things had to happen. Guilt had to be atoned for. The conscience of man had to be settled, or if you like, tranquilized. And the heart of man had to be purified. 
All of those things were involved in setting the unbeliever at peace and at rest before a sinless God. Now, the very fact that the Levitical priesthood is inadequate to achieve this is made abundantly clear, as the writer says, since long after the establishment of this priesthood, there was still need for another priest to come. One, he says in verse 11, in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. Because what was there was, as far as verse 18 is concerned, weak and useless. Now, this is something that he is going to drive home with great conviction and renewed emphasis in the verses that follow. And for example, if you turn a page in your Bible, you'll be at chapter 10, and you will find that he is going to say the same thing. And I just want to anticipate it with you for emphasis this evening. Verse 1 of 10, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, he says to them, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But the fact is, they always felt guilty for their sins because what they experienced in the structure of the Levitical priesthood was only that which could be of transient import to them. And they were coming back again and again. Now, while the Israelites then were enabled to render an outward obedience to the laws, which regulated the service of the earthly temple and sanctuary, the priests of the people were unable, totally powerless, to effect the inward cleansing of conscience that was necessary. They were unable to bring to the people that which could make perfect. And those who drew near to worship, as he says in chapter 10, were left uh, kind of high and dry. Now, back in chapter 7 and verses 12 and 13, the writer makes the point that these means and laws to which he's referring served a temporary purpose. And when the time came, they had to be changed for something that would be permanent, complete, and eternal, because what was represented in this structure was impermanent and incomplete and valid only in time. And so he says, it's very important for you to understand that he, the one who was to come in the order of Melchizedek, and we're in verse 13 and then into 14, did not descend from the tribe of Levi. He belonged to a different tribe. He says in 13, and no one from the tribe to which he belonged has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from the tribe of Judah. You remember in the Old Testament that he is the Lion of Judah who breaks the chains uh, that bind uh, those who are held in captivity. And in regard to that tribe, Moses has said nothing about priests. Now, again, the logic is fairly straightforward. Since Jesus had no right to minister at the material altar, it would be inconceivable that they would maintain such altars in light of the nature of his priesthood. So that if you imagine all that was represented in the ceremonial structure of the Levitical system, fully in force, uh, surrounded by people, and then comes one after the order of Melchizedek, and on his cross there is a once and for all atoning sacrifice for sins, and unlike the Levitical priests who only were able to exercise priesthood for a while, he now is a, exercising a permanent and eternal priesthood, it is inconceivable that people would still keep coming to these ta tables and going through all of this stuff. That which had been before was obsolete, and that which had now come in the person of Christ was perpetually significant. 
Hence his quote from the psalm we read, for it is declared, verse 17, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. The law made nothing perfect. It couldn't make the priests perfect. It couldn't provide a perfect expiation for sin. It couldn't afford men and women's hearts a perfect peace. It couldn't grant to them a perfect conscience. If it had been able to accomplish all of that, then it would have been permanent. And it was on, effect, on account of the fact that it couldn't, that it was to pass away. Well, the thoughtful person is then inevitably going to say, well, then why did it even exist? Why did it exist? Well, we could spend a long time answering that question, but in essence, the answer is because it foreshadowed the grace which was to be revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the benefits that it conveyed in that system were on the basis of Christ's forthcoming sacrifice so that people were redeemed in the Old Testament the way that people are redeemed in the New Testament. There wasn't an Old Testament way and a New Testament way. People were redeemed in the Old Testament in prospect of the atoning sacrifice which would be made in the person and work of the great high priest. And people are redeemed in the New Testament era and in our era on the strength of that to which we look back. And so they looked forward, albeit not seeing it in all of its fullness, and yet trusting in the promise of God, and we look back to it, and at the same place we find forgiveness of sins, peace with God, a cleansed conscience, and a whole new hope. It is at the cross that we see the light and are born again. And that is why the once-for-all sacrifice negates all of the previous regulations. And in the giving of himself, the Lord Jesus Christ vanquished any form of remaining divine authority for all the rites and regulations that went before. And if you know your Bible at all, you know that in the death of Christ upon the cross, there was given, at least to the immediate residents of Jerusalem, the classic and graphic illustration of this. It must have been an amazing event to be standing in the temple, the precincts, at the time of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For all those who had gathered there were most aware of the fact that there were certain precincts into which one could go, the court of the Gentiles and the court of the Jews and the place of the priests, and then finally into the Holy of Holies, which was separated by this mammoth curtain, which once and for all symbolized the fact that you can't draw near to God. Someone else is going to have to go and do that for you. And before they ever go in there, they're going to have to make sure they've cleaned themselves up. And as they gathered on that day, witless, the vast majority of them, to what was taking place, all of a sudden this gigantic curtain is torn apart in a dramatic, symbolic gesture on the part of God to say to men and women, step this way. Now, loved ones, I need to say to you tonight that to cling to the shadow is to forfeit the substance that it represents. I was involved in a significant discussion yesterday with a man who was trying to explain to me that it was fine for him to hold on to the shadows, although he still believed in the substance. I don't think so because the reality is so different from the shadow. Once you have embraced the real thing, why would you ever want to spend time around those tables again? You think it out, you're sensible people. What is this better hope in verse 19? From whence does it spring? How can we have a better hope? by which we draw near to God. Well, it is a hope which springs from belief in the indestructible life of the Lord Jesus Christ and the assurance that that life is still active in his priestly function as he intercedes for us. 
It is a better hope which is anchored within the veil, fixed in the person of Christ, which is able to bring us immediately and wonderfully into his presence. Now, in verses 20 to 28, which is the final section, he simply goes on to provide further instruction and make some crucial points of application. And he makes much of the fact that the Lord Jesus has been appointed priest not by regulation of the law, not on the basis of the ancestry which was his, but he has been appointed on the basis of an oath. And it was not without an oath, he says, exclamation mark. And of course, again, the readers would be immediately tuned into this in a way that we need educated to. He then quotes from the Psalm 110 and the fourth verse, which we read earlier. And the point that he is making is the self-same point. It is the superiority of the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you will perhaps recall from chapter 6 that this is the second occasion in which the writer to the Hebrews tells his readers that God has sworn by an oath. Back in verse 13 of chapter 6, we read, When God made his promise to Abram, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. Now, what does this mean? Well, Peter Adam very helpfully says, The fact that God swears on oath means that he will certainly do what he has promised that he stakes his whole character and credibility on doing it. It is not that God's ordinary promises are less trustworthy, but when he swears on oath with a promise, he is letting his people know of the crucial and central importance of a particular promise within his purposes. So that it is not that his promises are any less trustworthy without an oath, but when he swears by an oath, he is reinforcing a vital, central truth. Now, if you think that out in relationship to the two promises here in chapter 6 and chapter 7, you will understand something very wonderful, because these two promises are at the very heart of biblical faith. For example, back in chapter 6, we might backtrack for a moment, God's promise to Abraham, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants began to be fulfilled in the calling and keeping of his chosen people, right? It was then fulfilled in the Lord Jesus, Abraham's descendant, who in God's plan was to bring blessing to all the nations through his atoning death. Because when you read in the Old Testament of the promise of God to Abram, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. You say, well, what does that possibly mean? Well, it means that it finds its fulfillment insofar as Jesus, as a descendant from Abraham, lives his life, dies an atoning death, and thereby makes it possible for the Muslim and the Buddhist and the pagan in 20th century America to be born again of the Spirit of God and to understand and life in all of its fullness. The promise advances in fulfillment when you discover Jews and Gentiles both coming to trust in Christ, both discovering what God has done in Jesus, and both becoming the children of Abraham. You see what I'm saying? The promise made to Abraham finds its fulfillment in the choosing of his special people. It is advanced in the coming of Christ and in his atoning death whereby men and women may trust in Christ throughout all the nations of the earth, and Jew and Gentile together may become his children. Indeed, ultimately, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the result of God's promise to Abraham. And while this may not mean much to many, the story of the Bible and the story of church history is the record of God doing what he swore to do. That's the whole story of the Bible. It is the unfolding of God swearing on oath to Abram, in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed, and you can take everything from that point and run it out. In the same way, in the second promise to which he refers here, the promise that God makes to Jesus, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, it was fulfilled in the Incarnation. 
When Jesus died as an atoning sacrifice, when he was raised from death to the right hand of God, where he continues as a priest forever. And the story of salvation in Christ is the story of God doing what he swore to do. Now, let me just reinforce this for you in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 11. In him, that is in Jesus, we, also, we were also chosen. Remember, God chose the Jews. How odd of God to choose the Jew? And what was it that God determined in these people that he would choose them? What does he say in Deuteronomy? He says, I didn't choose you or call you because you were more significant than any other person. I didn't choose you because I saw in you some peculiar redeeming quality. I simply loved you because I loved you. And I determined of my own sovereign free choice to make a promise to you that will be throughout all time significant in its implications. What does he say to us in redeeming us? The exact same thing. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. You may need to get the tape and go back and listen to this to unpack some of the truth I'm conveying to you, but understand, in his merciful goodness, God deigned to enter into a covenant with us through the work and merit of his Son. And he is the initiator in the covenant. And it is this better covenant of which Jesus himself has become the guarantee. Verse 2, because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. In other words, you can bank on it. And you can bank on it in the bank of heaven. Lay not up for yourselves, says Jesus, treasures on earth, where moth and rust get in and eat it and bite it and destroy it, and where thieves come in and steal the stuff. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. He's talking there about our endeavors as we live out our lives. But the great significant treasure which is ours in heaven is the treasure of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And when I am tempted to despair. And when, like many of these early readers, I feel like chucking it, and when I am so confronted by my own waywardness and my disinterest in the things of Christ and my, my lax approach to so much, and when all the accusations of the evil one are against me saying, you know, you have got no guarantee whatsoever that you will make it in the end, I'm going to remind him, that in the Lord Jesus Christ, on account of God's oath, stated plainly in the 110th Psalm, I have in Jesus a guarantee of a better covenant. Now, let me just work out some practical application of this, and we're through. First of all, in verse 23, notice that the priesthood of the Lord Jesus is permanent rather than temporary. No matter how dedicated these Old Testament priests may have been, death put an end to their work. That's what he says. Death prevented them from continuing in office. But look at verse 24. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. That work of the cross, which was once and for all, is abiding in its significance. And Jesus ever lives. Secondly, his power is limitless. Verse 25, isn't that what he's saying? In light of this, he says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because of this very permanence, because he always lives to intercede for them. 
This Lord Jesus is able to secure salvation for all who come to him. He is the only source of salvation. All false religion is simply a choice of other things and other people in which men and women place their trust to the neglect of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is able to save entirely and forever. If I was trapped somewhere in the caves of Yorkshire down a deep pothole, and I cried out for someone to come to my rescue, and eventually someone appeared, and I felt my spirits lift within me at the prospect of my deliverance, and they let me down a rope upon which I fastened my hands with great eagerness. And they began to pull me up. And the higher I came, the more I realized that the rope was fraying on the sides of the millstone grit, which is so much a part of those cave dwellings. And I realized that there was every prospect that in a moment the rope may finally fray, and I would crash all the way to the bottom and may never, ever be able to raise my voice in a plea for rescue again. That would be a cruel experience, imaginary albeit, but that's some people's view of what it is to become a Christian, that they think that Jesus can save them a wee bit, but they're going to have to try their best in case they snap the rope that they're going to have to make a contribution to it to fill up anything that might be missing, that they cannot somehow or another trust themselves unreservedly into the work of what Jesus has done. And so you meet them all the time and everywhere, proclaiming a salvation, which is a little bit of believing plus a little bit of doing. Salvation is all about believing. Believing, believing, believing. How much doing was there for the thief on the cross? Exactly. If salvation was about believing plus doing, with the doing making a contribution to the salvation event, then all of us would be scurrying from hither and yon to try and ensure that we were okay. But when we get a grasp of biblical theology, then it will radically change us. When we get a hold of Top Lady's words, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. What use is a Christ who cannot save completely and eternally? I don't want to know of a salvation that lasts for a moment in time, that has an expiry date on it, that needs constant renewal. Tear off the bottom portion and send it back in to let me know if you're still on board. Thirdly, notice that he is always living to intercede. Let me just say it to you again in the words of the hymn writer. I say it so often, but it's one of my quotes as I go around in my car. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. And if you'll get that anchored in your heart, loved one, if the Spirit of God will burn that into the recesses of your being, if that will become for you the reality of your trust and your hope and your confident, confidence, your life will be revolutionized. And the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ is that which is exercised meaningfully 
as we've already seen on account of his identification with us. Remember back in verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. So his intercession is meaningfully done. It is compassionately done, and it is effectively done. He has the power to meet all of our needs. And therefore, he says in verse 26, it is significant that this high priest is sinless in his character. Notice that he is holy in his character and his will. He was blameless before men. Remember, the Pharisees came again and again to try and find something to say about Jesus, try and find fault with him in some way, and they couldn't find fault. When Pilate took him and examined him, eventually he says, I'm going to have to wash my hands of this predicament because I can find no fault in the man. And he sends him off somewhere else, and the other person says, you know, I really don't understand what everyone's on about. He seems to be faultless. Even his enemies had nothing to say about him. He was pure, and his purity was a real purity, not a ritual purity. He was set apart from sinners. Well, you say, but didn't they call him the friend of publicans and sinners? Yes. So what does he was set apart from sinners mean? It clearly then does not mean that he never spent time with sinners because we know that he did. It clearly does not mean that he did not address sinners in the most intimate of ways because we know that he did. It simply means this, that he was in no sense compromised or contaminated by his contact with sinful men and women. And he is the one, he says, who is exalted above the heavens and sits at God's right hand. And he, in verse 27, unlike the other priests, is able to have offered a perfect sacrifice. The other priests offered sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. And Jesus sacrificed their, for their sins once for all when he offered himself. It was a sacrifice that was unique in its permanence, in its purity, in its efficacy, and in its cost. There's a whole sermon there I think you would understand, but we don't have time for it this evening. Have you understood what it means for Jesus to have sacrificed for sins once for all in the offering of himself? In light of the scene upon the cross, is it not arrogant and pompous for us to feel somehow or another that we can make ourselves acceptable to God? That we would run the risk and run the gamut of trying to outweigh the balances of our bad with the expressions of our good? The law appointed man, he says in verse 28, with sinful infirmities, but with an oath which came after the law, the sinless Son in the perfection of his sacrificial work was appointed to the task that no one else could fulfill. It's that lovely Easter hymn, There is a green hill far away outside a city wall where the dear Lord was crucified who died to save them all. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Oh, dearly, dearly has he loved, and we must love him too, and trust in his redeeming blood, and try his works to do. When I concluded my studies this week, I said there are two things then that I must resolve to continually do, and here they are. I must resolve with confidence to trust in God's Word, to trust in God's Word. For the book of Hebrews is essentially about two things. It is about revelation, namely what God has said to us, and it is about redemption, what God has done for us. 
And therefore, the whole message of Hebrews should bring us again and again back to the word of truth so that we might say, I'm going to take my stand and my trust in the word of God. And I am going to rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the author of an eternal salvation, we've been told in verse 9 of chapter 5, and therefore he is the source of our present salvation. He is the one who rescued us, and he is the one who rescues us, and he is the one who will continue to rescue us. The hymn writer says, Day by day and with each passing moment, strength have I to face my troubles there. Why? Because of the abiding, permanent significance of the work of the Lord Jesus. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my life in the cleft of the rock where rivers of mercy I see. When we grasp this, then lines out of hymns like His oath, His covenant, His blood support me in the whelming flood. I mean, how many times have you sung that hymn? And you say to yourself, what in the world is this? His oath, his covenant, his blood. Maybe we've got a little bit about blood because we've been at enough Easter services, but what about this covenant? What was that? And what is this oath? It is this, that God from the very essentials of eternity entered into a covenant. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit covenanting together that they would redeem a people. And it is the utterly undeserved privilege of all of us who come to trust in the saving work of Christ to have been included in that company of the redeemed. This is not arm's length theology. This is vital, essential, biblical stuff to give us confidence in the day of difficulty, to give us peace when our conscience alarms us. And when the flood threatens to overwhelm us, we will turn again to the rock that is higher than ourselves. And on that solid rock, we'll take our stand. Let's pause for a moment in prayer. There are some of you here tonight, and today has been news to you. This evening is news to you. You might be a religious person. You've done a lot of good things throughout your life. But as you have been pondering what that has meant to you, you've got to admit that you still have a burden of sin. You have to admit that you have no assurance of forgiveness, that you have no assurance that if you were to die tonight, you would go to heaven. And you may even have stepped up your religious endeavors. You may have started to even try harder. You may even have begun to come to church regularly in the hope that maybe that would gain you enough points. And now you've come and you've heard this dreadful news that the rope upon which you've been relying is snapped and broken, and you're at the bottom of the canyon, and there's no way out. Certainly not in your own strength. But the good news is that the Lord Jesus has come to provide the only way out. And if you would admit where you are and believe that he came to be that Savior that you've just admitted that you need, then you need to consider the implications of turning away from your sin and trusting unreservedly in Christ. Because it'll be a radical difference. And then you need to do something about it. And just where you're seated, to cry out to God for his mercy and for his grace. To say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're able to save me completely. I've been trying to save myself, patch myself up, and I recognize this evening that it can't be done Will you do for me what I cannot do for myself? I want to be your child. If you 
are expressing that in your own heart. And the promise of God's Word is, as you just read it, that He is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto God through Him. And a divine transaction takes place. Father, I pray that since we've dealt with issues of such eternal significance, that each of us tonight will examine our lives before the compelling story of the good news. Show us ourselves. Show us our Savior. And make the book live to us. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org. Powerful. Um, and I've watched this now. Um, probably this is my fourth time. Um, some things that really stood out to me uh, and prompted me to remember um, in the in the Jewish faith in the uh, the old system. Can you hear me better now, guys? I'm, I'm sorry. No. Yeah. Wow. Okay. okay. There must be, and, and you know what? I'm wondering if there's a, some kind of volume control in audio settings, speakers. Um, just looking here to see. See, I don't have any other volume controls. I turned my volume all the way up, and then the video itself, the volume was all the way up. Um, the, the video is fine, and your speaking is fine, at least on my computer. Okay. Now, Mike and Lori have problems with hearing. Um, so I'm <coughs> sorry, guys. I, I don't know what else to say. I can hear you guys whispering. I mean, that's just good, I guess. Uh, unless you're talking about something you shouldn't. Anyway, um, I'm sorry you guys are having to listen so hard today. I, I don't know what to, what to say. Um, anyway, um, some things that came to me when I was, I was watching this for the, like I say, fourth time. <clears throat> the Jewish faith, the, the old temple system, um, they were... They couldn't take away the guilt and i'm reminded of the catholic faith if you've um had any interfacing with cat with roman catholics which i know bill you have you married one um that faith stressed guilt a lot uh, my first wife's mother was a devout roman catholic and it was like there was always a burden of guilt on her uh, and she always felt guilty and of course, what they're talking about today in, in chapter 7 is the removal of that guilt. You take the guilt away. Um, Jesus is able to do that. And that's part of the cleansing process that we have. And another reason why his priesthood is much better than the, uh, the old priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. So the Holy Spirit can take guilt away. And, of course, we need... As Alistair said, um, we have to trust in that, and we have to live into that. Um, and the other thing, too, of course, several things. Um, there's, we can't save ourselves. Um, and he talked about the rope dropping into the canyon. Uh, some of us uh, are maybe uh, the rope is broken. We're down the bottom of the canyon. We think, well, there's nothing. I've sinned too much, or um done too much uh, for me i mean I've, I've done too many wrong things um but again stressing what what this book says what the chapter says he is able to save to the uttermost no matter what we've done no matter uh how we've sinned his sacrifice 
paid the price for our sin. But we have to trust in that sacrifice and we have to trust in him um, and not trust in being busy. And, and okay, well, you know, I'm glad Jesus died for me, but I've got to do something here to save myself. Well, works, as Mike's talked about, I've talked about before, works, the things we do are a, uh, a fruit of the salvation we receive from Christ, but they don't help save us. Uh, and that's, again, uh, Roman Catholic faith. Um, you better be working. You know, it's it's they have a, a faith plus works salvation. And that's Old Testament. That's not New Testament. Um, so I, I encourage you to trust in Christ as far as your salvation. Only trust in that. The works, we should be doing works. If we're, if we're Christians, if we're saved, well, yes, we should be doing works. But those works we do won't save us. They can't save us. Only Christ can save us. Alistair made really did a really good job of pointing that out. And, um, we have to trust in Christ for our salvation, period. Um, there's no salvation in any other name. There's nothing that I can do to save myself. Uh, it's all a work of the cross, it's all a work of what Christ did on the cross for us. I really liked his analogy of the rope. Yes. Yes. Yeah. A um, long time ago, I talked about a sermon. Um, it's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God uh, by Jonathan Edwards. And his analogy was we're all standing on a rotting plank over hell, over the abyss of hell. And the plank is, is giving way. And... Uh, uh, if we don't trust Christ, that plank breaks, down we go. And the only reason that plank hasn't broken yet is by God's pure grace and mercy. Um, but we have, he's waiting for us to trust Christ. One of the dangers of God's common grace, of his common mercy, the things he does for us, for everyone, every day, God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. One of the dangers of that is we we just take it for granted and say, well, I must be okay. And nothing could be further from the truth. God has, he blesses everyone, if you will. There's a common grace, a common um, way that we are blessed by God, even if you're not saved. You, the fact that we're still, that people who haven't trusted Christ are still alive is a testament to God's mercy. But God's mercy runs out as soon as someone passes away or dies without Christ, then then God becomes a God of justice. And unless you've trusted in the sacrifice, you have to believe that God is, um, that you have to believe that God is a righteous God and can a holy God and can have nothing to do with sin. And if you've done that, then the only atonement since we've all sinned is the sacrifice that he himself provided and he made himself that's when you grasp that when you really understand that that is the the unbelievable part of our faith that he loved us that much that he would allow himself to be killed allow his only son to be killed rather than see those who would trust in him be damned for eternity. Um, something else that I, I just, I heard recently, and this bears a little bit of meaning to this, but that I've heard in the past, people say, well, when you're in hell, God isn't there. Oh, no, God is there in hell. God's everywhere. God's mercy is not there. God's grace is not there. God's judgment is in hell. So, um, you know, you can't escape God. He's everywhere. Uh, and I can come up with a great, great joke about it, but it's not funny. It's true. God is everywhere, and including God's in hell. But it's uh, His justice is there. And again, unless we, unless someone trusts in Jesus, 
for their salvation, then they're, as we talked about in Hebrews, and we talk, we'll talk about it again in chapter 10, uh, there is no more sacrifice. There is no other sacrifice that can be made. And going back to the sacrificial system, the Levitical priesthood, the Levitical priesthood made, God was so angry that they did not accept the sacrifice that he made and didn't accept his son. They rejected his son. That in 70 AD, remember what happened? The temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was sacked and destroyed. And the temple was destroyed. Now we're told in the millennial kingdom, there'll be another, there'll be another temple built. Um, which is okay. God has a reason for that. I don't know what it might be, but there will be another temple built. And they will be doing, if, if you listen to some uh, writers about that temple in the millennial kingdom, there will be sacrifices done. That's what what uh, some of the uh, uh, writers talk about who talk about that. that that's you talking about the temple being built you know mary and i are reading the bible right uh through in a year we mm -hmm. just finished part of exodus that talks about the the description of building the temple and even though i've read it before reading through it again it just boggles my mind how detailed it is and how complicated it was and how much gold and silver it took and how they physically did that you know hammering all the gold i mean pretty mind-boggling if you look at the details of it it is and and god warned moses be careful to do everything exactly as i told you right in other words you have to as i showed you yes okay and god in an interesting thing if you read the details of how the original the 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 portable temple which it was it was a portable temple moved right. around. um if you read the details well so and so was enabled and given uh a skill of gold work and so and so was given a skill of uh of, of different skills that were right. that were required well even the skills to build it were given by god um, he I mean, the people who did it and one the, part uh, one part of it it even said and you're going to use 75 pounds of gold to make this part of it uh, that, and this thing is portable this yes. thing weighed a lot it did <laughs> it did and that's why they had a whole tribe of people carrying it around um and that's why uh, if you recall when we read isaiah and and, uh, the, and read the chronicles and, and the book of kings hezekiah showed the babylonians all the treasures of the temple while isaiah came back and says uh, uh you shouldn't have done that because now they're going to come and take it you know now they know you got it they want it because and uh the word is said when solomon was king that he quote unquote quartered the gold market he had most of the gold, known gold in the world at the time. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar being a, an earthly king needed money to pay his army and they didn't have the American dollar to back by uh, the faith, full faith and credit of the United States government. They did not, they didn't do that back then. You had to have gold or silver or precious metals. It was strictly by the book, if you will. And he needed money to fight his wars and he was conquering and jerusalem was a great great uh place to get gold he found out so yeah but the original tabernacle again that tabernacle was only a type and if you read it even the details in leviticus the, the different services the priesthood all priesthood christ honored all that did all that and has made a one-time sacrifice for us so that doesn't have to happen anymore for our sanctification. And it's a better sanctification because not only are our sins forgiven, but he takes our guilt away if we trust in him. We have to trust in him. And again, he saves to the uttermost. We have to trust him to the uttermost. 
for that salvation. And that's part of our, uh, if you're not trusting in Christ for your salvation, then you, you better feel guilty and you better turn to him and repent and be saved. It's, a, it's an easy process to do, but it has to happen. Um, God's made it as simple as possible. Like I said earlier, he sacrificed himself so this could happen. So we don't have to spend eternity in hell. God is a righteous God. God is a just God. And there has to be, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> By Christ shed blood, our sins are forgiven. But you have to trust in that. It's not, salvation is not universal. He didn't die for everybody, for, for the people who didn't trust in him. He only died for those for his own, if you will. <clears throat> Mike, you're begging to say something, aren't you? No. Okay. All good. Okay. About three minutes till uh, seven. Any other comments? I've talked an awful lot, as I always do, but talked more than usual today. Any other comments before we call it a morning? Okay. Um, Mike, would you pray for us this morning as we go out? Certainly. Father, just thank you for... Uh... Uh, the ability to get together like this, uh, the technology. We thank you for Scott's efforts uh, to bring us the message and uh, uh, the fact that we can watch Alistair Begg this morning and um, get his message. Um, uh, we just thank you for all these things. We will pray that you be with uh, each of us as we go about our business today and uh, uh, bring us home safe to worship you again together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, please click the link in the upper right-hand corner to view our message, the most important video you will ever watch. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m., either in person at 2595 Elmwood Avenue in Kenmore, New York or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash KNOXEPC. Find past sermons on our website knoxepc.com forward slash sermons. Stay up to date with Knox Church. To receive our monthly newsletter, email office at knoxepc.com. If you need prayer, send an email to pastor at knoxepc.com. You can request text alerts by texting 734-968-1847. Knox Sunday School happens every Sunday at 9 a.m. for kids grades kindergarten through 8th, and for adults of all ages. Email office at knoxepc.com for more information. Knox Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Our motto is truthful teaching, and graceful living. We are committed to growing in the knowledge of Jesus, serving Him by serving others, and loving the body of Christ. To donate to Knox Church via PayPal, Visit knoxepc.com and click on giving at the top of the page, or scan the QR code above with your smartphone or tablet. Special thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the members of Knox Church. Without them, this outreach wouldn't be possible.